Hello. Good morning. morning. Good morning. What a nice change morning for us. Morning for us. Record in the morning. Yes. So, um, it's because it's the day. It's yeah. the morning. Yeah. We can't be cooking up a heavy dinner. No. I didn't want to do that. We've had some heavy meals. I thought let's go for something nice and simple. Yeah. Let's make a cup of coffee, cup of tea, love that. and have some fresh pastries. Oh, real yeah, local, I love that. Real local bakery. Oh, look at you. Okay, you like, I know what I'm doing. It's like you know? I'm going to go for a tea because I haven't had tea. one today and yeah. I have a headache as a result. <laughs> Um, yeah, let's get this going, let's get some drinks on and uh, let's have some breakfast. Lovely. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. What is it nice to film the show in the morning for, hey, for a change? Shit. I'm, I'm... Right, I'm, I'm awake, mm. I'm uh, fresh-faced. Show's not gonna be better, but... <laughs> no, 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 it will be markedly worse. Yeah. Um, so, to reflect that, you know, we've had some wonderful, we've had some wonderful food, we've had some wonderful heavy dishes, but I thought it's morning, let's make it light. Yeah. I, I, you, know the, you know that phrase that's like, often re quoted where people are like, you should begin your day, like eat like a king, then a prince, then a pauper, for like breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Oh, interesting. I, I think that's incorrect. I haven't heard that. Other way around. I, I like to agree. eat light, eat a little bit heavier, then, See me out to bed on a heavy dinner. Anyway, so to reflect that, I've got us some pastries this morning. Uh, uh, we've made, you've got a cup of coffee, I've yep. got a cup of tea. We've got two croissants, we've got a blueberry muffin, and we have a cinnamon swirl from your lovely local bakery around the corner. And they look beautiful. I assume the shots are just rolling in front of people's eyes right now, but they look <laughs> brilliant. The only thing is about the croissant is that it's very hard to eat that elegantly. No, they are incredibly fragile. They look wonderful, but they are brittle. There you will got, be flakes everywhere. With a, with a croissant, you know what you're getting into when you when you sign up for one. You're going to wear it, <laughs> yeah. and that's fine. And especially if you're sitting down. Yeah. You, and I think the only way to enjoy it is to just full send, yeah. commit, and go. Yeah. Someone's going to go, you've got stuff. I'll just go, yeah, I know. Which is why I find it interesting Susan. that, that, that <laughs> croissants are eaten so much in offices, because you're just yeah. like, you're going to, you know, you're saying to your colleague, basically, watch me eat this. <laughs> <laughs> It's just like a snowfall of yeah. flakes yeah. coming down. Yeah. An avalanche. It's like a head and shoulders ad. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so I think we should start with the croissant. I feel like the, the other stuff's a bit heavy. Yeah, savory then sweet. Yeah, I actually, I like my croissant very plain. I'm not yeah. going to have any jam on it. I think we That's go. fine. I mean, we probably just need butter, but let's just get that. I mean, yeah, to put butter on a pastry is the most insane thing. God. It is made of butter. This is dense. It's like the dense. size of a rugby ball. This has weight. This is, that's like, you know, Hey Arnold, it looks like his face. <laughs> yeah. If someone came in and attacked us, I'd I, I, it. I, I, <laughs> to get this. the heavy light stands you know and camera what? equipment. Let's I, get this on the camera. I'm gonna break this. Wait, I'm, I'm gonna break sound. It. Do it sound. sound. Yeah. Oh. oh. And then you've got that. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. All of it. Not bad. All right. Um, yeah. The, the the croissant <laughs> as a as an item is so widely consumed. Mm. Considering it's like this very. I know it's like a sort of pinnacle of breakfast food, but they really are everywhere. Uh, yeah. Like yeah. they're 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 very overexposed. I think the croissant. Don't get me wrong. Love I love a good French yeah. pastry. Do you like a croque monsieur or a croque madame? I do like a, a, all the grocs. Yeah. I, 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 th I think I think we need a third grok. Croc. 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 It's croc. Croc. I said croc. Yeah. It's not croc. <laughs> yeah. It's croc. Like yeah. Like what, the what? Shoe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you name a third croc? A croc of shit. <laughs> yeah. um, James, I'm, I'm 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 kind of captivated by you because you're you've cut your I'm, you've I'm, cut yours nicely into a sandwich. I've filleted shape. it. Oh, and I've ripped mine. Yeah, but I, I think sometimes so you, when you butterfly fly a chicken breast, that's what I've done for anyone listening. I think e it's equally valid. You yeah, because you, you you kind of engage with food differently. You tear like a like a caveman. Yeah. I fillet <laughs> like I'm, I've been invited if by the queen. Know, if anyone who knows me, I am brutish. <laughs> yeah. I am just Neanderthal yeah. like. <laughs> Um, mm. Yeah, I'm gonna lather up some some butter and some jam. I mean, I th I think like with most bread, you've got to get it six a.m. <laughs> Jamie, Lee, have yeah. you ever? This sounds really sad, but if you're ever up early enough, just to go into like the Sainsbury's local on the high street mm. as they bring the, the pastries out. Amazing, amazing. You might think, what, Sainsbury's local pastries? Yes, because when you, by the time you get to them, they've been sitting on the shelf and they get all hard and crusty and they, they lose their life. But if you ever are early enough to catch them, thank me later. They're you, really good. Did you see the video on, like, it was doing the rounds of the mice in the Tesco's I Express? I did yeah. see that. Yeah. What the uh, hell? Yeah, so you, you open pastry goods in your yeah. regular supermarket. <laughs> yeah, maybe wait maybe for don't. that whole thing to die down. Yeah. I used to work at a supermarket when I was younger. Mm. And I used to work on the patisserie counter. Oh, lots of the counters, and we used to... 
I'm picturing you in a white and black striped shirt with a little beret yep. on. Yeah, it, yeah that's it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but hey, George, you know, the best dream. <laughs> well, it, it wish, I wish it was that authentic because we didn't need the dough or anything. You know, I hate to say these things just come in pre-frozen. You just mm. whack it in the oven and it just, I mean, they oh, taste sure. amazing. But even though the pastry is a French export, something about having butter and jam on pastry or even any bread feels very English. I'm having a nice cup of tea. In this particular morning light, a little, it's, it's now October, it's getting a little bit chillier in the morning. An idea feels way, very yeah. English. What I would have done to have this is actually, it, it, I can imagine now sitting out in the park, crisp autumn weather, crisp mm. autumn leaves, and I would have had just a plain crush on, cross on freshly baked mm -hmm. with just a cup of coffee, and that's it. In, um, speaking of bread, in um, Ratatouille. Which I watched for the first time last week. Oh my God. Yeah, I've uh, never seen it before. Ratatouille is a really great film that George hasn't seen and now yeah. he's seen it, yeah. Yeah, I know. And, and, I, and I, I don't knew, I, I was, cause I was doing, you know, we're doing this show and I was like, food and film. There's not Come many, on. and Ratatouille. And Chef Ratatouille. It's the only, the only homework you needed for this, George. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sorry, I'll let you finish a point. That's all, but you know when she's like, the key to good bread is not the look, and then she crushes it. Oh, it's, it's the sound. sound. Oh, I and know. she's the baguette and just holds it up. And you're like, Damn Do you it. know what? I love that. The bit in that film that really got me, I enjoyed it. On the most. I mean, yeah. all the bits with the rat, great. I think all the bits with Linguini, I was like, okay, this could, you know. Linguini. Yeah. <laughs> Again, that's Ian Holm, who we talked about last week. What with, is with it? Big he? Night. Oh. He's not Italian. He's just, you're doing the Italian noise. <laughs> It's um, a rat. It is the rat. And also, like, what a horrible character of an evil person. Let's make him short. Let's yeah. make him, you know, evil. I'm covered in pastry, by the way. Completely covered. Um, the bit in Ratatouille that really got me, and this is a semi-spoiler, but again, it's been out for 14 years. Like, give me a break. Um, I love the character of Anton Ego, who's the food mm. critic. He's and the way that his Perfect. they did they give the um the bird's eye view of his of his house and it's shaped like a coffin and he's very gothic and he's just such a like a german expressionist kind of figure he, skinny pointy nose he's judgmental he's, he was yeah. painted to be far more villainous than the current character yeah. was yeah. because what i love he that, looked as evil yeah. as as maleficent yeah and they're, they're building it up to this evil moment and then what i love is that it's ratatouille's moment and, and he's not sorry he's not called ratatouille he's called remy remy yeah. remy the rat yeah makes the makes ratatouille the peasant uh, dish. The peasant dish, which is like, you know, basically roasted vegetables presented, you know. Courgette, like, pepper. Yeah. Um, and he puts it in front of this food critic and this food critic sort of goes, mm -hmm. and he bites into it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And, he, and he bites into and it. Then, and it instantly, <laughs> he's back. There's like and this a punch zoom yeah. that just swims him back and this to color, the like provincial floods, countryside. Yeah, yeah. floods the lens and, it, and, it, and you're back and he's a child and his mother is making him um, roast, making your ratatouille and he's sitting down, he's eating it. And honestly, I welled up. Yeah. And I, I just suddenly just like, that's bloody Pixar, just got me right in the heart. What? And I was like, that is that is food. That, and, and, and film as well, just like so connected to your childhood and, and to memory. And and this massive character that they built up for the whole film just deflates in front just, of you. It was a simple execution in 10 yeah. minutes. You know how like the opening of Up can made you cry in five minutes? It was, it, was, it was that again, it was a simple execution of build this character up. It's like, I don't like food, I love mm. food. And he's ordering a bottle of Chianti and he's sitting there, judgmental. You know, he's like looking through the little hole in the thing. Yeah. And he's so, he looks like he's so evil. And then just that moment yeah. brings you straight yeah. out. And you're like, that's just brilliant. When you're villain. And, and, he, gave, and he didn't show any expression. Yeah. He, he, he got it and then left. And then when you're his, antagonist and review. your protagonist are driven by the same thing, which is a love mm. of food. That's what it showed in that moment that the villain, he just wanted, he just loved food as well. Yep. And that's what it came to. And, 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 and I had he was searching for something. <laughs> oh, um, brilliant. Um, yeah, no, it's good. It's good. And it's funny. I love my favorite bit that me and my mate always do to each other is you know when he's asleep and he's controlling his 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 oh, hands ridiculous, yeah. and he does that thing where he he does this look where he goes like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he yeah. shakes his head uh, for, <laughs> for for our audio listeners he uh, James just nonchalantly like, kind of yeah what are you yeah, looking yeah, at kind and of then me and my mate whenever we're really like fed up and bored we ask each other a question we just go. <laughs> it was always do you know what that reminded me of when he's controlling Linguini with his hair the rat is you know yeah. It's a, it's a ridiculous concept. Yeah, I know. It's actually so stupid, but it's like Pacific Rim. It's like we are drift <laughs> compatible. It's the same thing. We're just going to control this massive body. Yeah. And they romanticize Paris so well. Oh, out over the do spots. they? Yeah. And Auguste Gusteau. Yeah. Hey, it is about food. Yeah. And food Very is good. about love. Yeah. So just FYI, I mean, we've just spoken about it, but the film, just, to, you know, a rat wants to be a cook. He's got a refined palate for I mean, a rat. I, most people have seen this. I don't think we need to explain George the point. If you haven't seen Pix, Ratatouille Pixar, I want to say, what, 2007? 
nine? Correct. Seven. Seven. Thank you. Um, yeah, I saw that film on a one of my like first ever awkward cinema dates where you just oh, sit there play, watching play it. Yeah. Play tell. How just, so you what, 12? 12, about 12. Awkward cinema date where, you know, you like hug, awkwardly go in, just sit there like that looking, but not doing anything. And you just, you just watch the film and then you leave and you go, okay, bye. bye. <laughs> that was the day. <laughs> my mom's picking me up, thanks. Yeah, my mom's picking me up, I'm here. I had that. I had that with the other film from 2007 about a rat going down a sewer, which was flushed away. Mm. Again, criminal, criminally awkward day. Nick, Nick Park and Wallace and Gromit. Stuff, yeah, right? not, a, not a good film. No. Not a good film. Although I've just realized, like... Forgot, forgotten, I'd say. Rightly so. Yeah. It's okay, you know. It's not, it's not like they were top tip Ardman. But I've just realized the villain in Flushed Away is Ian McKellen as the toad. Oh, right. But it's not too dissimilar from Peter O'Toole as Ego in uh, Ratatouille. They're both veteran actors, yep. but Peter O'Toole talks slightly more drunken than uh, yeah. Ian McKellen. He's, he's, he's been at the source a little bit longer, whereas Ian McKellen's been tighter. Yeah, he's a bit more whispery. Oh, he, he tends to uh, rush into a word. Rush into a you shall. Anyway. I remember I, even Callan, the extras bit where he's like, Peter Jackson called me up from New Zealand and he said, well, I want you to play Gandalf the Wizard. And you said, well, Peter, you do know I am not actually a wizard. He says, yes, I know that, but I need you to pretend for this movie that I did. So, so that's what I did. I, I bought into my mind. Imagine what it would be like. Yeah. <laughs> people have got, if people haven't seen it, it's the clip from Extras, Ricky Gervais' show, yeah. 2006. But just you could, could, could give it context to people. Um, and Ricky Gervais' character gets a part in a play with Ian McKellen. And it's this clip where Ian McKellen basically tells uh, Ricky Gervais' character what acting is all about. But it's just like, so blindingly obvious. But it's, it's really funny. And it's, I, I've watched that it's so It's a running joke that all the incredible actors he encounters in the industry and all the people yeah. cameoing are always disappointing in some way. They're always not what yeah. you expect. They're always actually a lot more... Sometimes they're really normal and sometimes they're really yeah. mental, but there's always something about them that's just completely off. Yeah. That, for me... And Ian McKellen's on it was like, he wasn't self-aware. Yeah, he wasn't. He was, so he, he said, like, how did I know where to stand? Somebody told me. Yeah. How did I know what to say? They wrote it down, down on the script for and, me. And, and, and Ricky's like, yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah, I, I understand know. acting, but <laughs> <laughs> he just didn't get it. Uh, I, I, but there, I, there'll be no scripts on the night. And that, that goes for everyone. Yeah. No yeah. scripts on <laughs> yeah. the night. Yeah, well, I know. Yeah. What's so great about extras is that Ricky Gervais is the only normal one and everyone around him is crazy. And, and Maggie also yeah. is normal, but she's yeah. a little bit crazy, but like in their normal no, way. No, no, really. He, he, it's like everyone around him is he, It's actually crazy. like the anti-David Brent. Whereas yeah. David Brent is the oddball that everyone reacts weirdly to. So true. No, it's the opposite. Like it's like everyone else is weird and Andy Millman is like... Mm -hmm. um, but with the other clip as well, this isn't from Extras, it's from Life's Too Short, but I've watched this a thousand times. I need to times. Life's Too Short. The, the sketch where Liam Neeson tries to pitch mm. himself as a stand-up comic. Stand -up comic. That, uh, that has become, there are phrases in that sketch, which is only about six minutes long, that I say in my everyday life, like to my girlfriend. There's, there's, he's so good at deadpan, Liam Neeson, in that when he says, uh-uh, wasn't me. I was at the doctor's. <laughs> and now, whenever someone tries to call me out on something and I think I'm wrong, I just go, no. Nope. It wasn't me. I wasn't here. <laughs> yeah. I was at the doctor's. Please watch it. It's it's and then also the, so the bloopers of them trying to film that scene oh, are yeah. amazing as well. I love it when really straight serious actors are actually hilarious underneath. And yeah. uh, you realize I, how I, hard I, they're working. I've seen Life's Too Short once, really liked it, but need to go back and watch it. Mm. So I'm a big Ricky Gervais fan. I never watched Derek. Did you watch Derek? I, I watched the first two seasons. Were there only two seasons? I don't know. I just Ricky Gervais usually does two then out. Wasn't Derek a bit of a, it started as an internal joke about, well, it started him mm. making a point about being able to talk about people who are disabled or make something funny about them. And someone was like, You're, you, can't, you, you can't make a comedy series about someone who's disabled. It's not possible. And he, did. And he was like, oh, I can. I, was like, I, I bet I can make a comedy series. And make people play, care. Pl playing yeah. someone disabled when I'm not and set it in a, in a nursing home where people are dying. I think it started as that. And then there was a pilot for Derek and there was only one episode for a really long time which was like to prove the point. And it was very good. And then it turned into a series. Huh. I yeah. think I could be wrong, but like, I remember this thing really? being more of like a challenge. Well, that's why I've never watched it. Cause I always look at it and I think, I'm sure that's not good. That can't be good in this day and age. But actually yeah. I, it did, it did have quite a, a following. I, it, the same thing with a lot of like Gervais' stuff, which is like on the surface, it looked like it was really silly or flippant or offensive, mm. but underneath it actually made a point and like had an emotional beat to it. Yeah. Not to 
now dissect Ricky Gervais' entire career. But actually, no. uh, Afterlife is an interesting one because you watch that on Netflix or watch season one. The, and exactly the same because I, 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 when they advertised season two, I was like, this show was done. They, yeah. they ended the story. You don't need to. And third. I saw the trailer for the season two. They've done three now. They're doing a third. But when I saw the trailer for the second one, it's like, you're just doing the same premise again. He's, it, the whole point is that he's meant to be uh, moving on by the, yeah. by the end of this first series. And then at the beginning of the second one, he's still sad again and i know i know that's how grief works it can you know come back and if, but the plot of that the plot of that screamed limited series to me he was at a point totally. starting off where he was suicidal and didn't know how to move on with life and at the end of the series he finds happiness in other realms right like yeah. that that to me is like okay that's an arc and you put comedy within that i think you can only have a show like afterlife with Ricky gervais at, with someone like it's very specific to him and where he is in his career because that show even though like the heart of it again very sincere <clears throat> and was making an interesting point the whole of it i found was just like so contrived so just 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 want to just explain what i mean by that yeah it's set in a sleepy english village uh which happens to be by the coast but they only mention for one episode but the sleepy english village has a thriving drug scene prostitute scene and a local paper that has can employ about 10 staff okay uh and he uh, and, uh, and support him to live in quite a really nice house which is actually filmed in Hampstead. i was gonna yeah. say so that all that was yeah. filmed literally far, like all around where yeah. i used to go to school because gervais has this thing where he's just like i only want to work with people that are nice and i would uh, anyway that's like near my house right yeah. so so when i was watching i was just like yeah but you've cut a lot of corners here in terms of like logic and i and and I feel like in other... He did it with Derek as well, a lot of that shot in Hampstead. So the thing about Ricky Gervais making those kind of shows, those sort of fairly contained series, like you said before, he wants to make it near his house with a sort of team of people that he often works with. I remember he was on, uh, I think he was either doing a late night interview or a podcast, and it was that, that week where Tom Cruise, that video of Tom Cruise on the set of Mission Impossible leaked, where he was screaming at people oh, yeah. for potentially like breaking COVID laws, yeah. and the whole thing was going to get shut down. And Ricky Gervais immediately came to his defense. It was like, yeah. sure, you know, it's not the best way to behave, but that guy is trying to get a 250 million pound movie made. Yeah. And he was like, that's why I would never, not that I get the offers to do them, it's like, mm. that's why I would never do a high pressure movie mm. that costs that amount of money and have yeah. a studio breathing down my neck to get mm. it done. Because if it fails, the yeah. pressure's just too much and I don't enjoy it. And he's mm. like, I'm lucky enough in my career to go, okay, what would I actually want to do for a smaller amount of money that can be a success with something yeah. else that just doesn't have the pressure? Um, and he swore, he says he's like, I'm at an age where I just don't want to work in that way. Yeah. And he was also acknowledged that he's not Tom Cruise. And Tom Cruise is a lot better no, than but him. I, I, I agree. When I heard that. that clip as well, it was so different to uh, uh, like Christian Bale, you know, with the shouting about the lights. Because yeah. I was like, you know what? Tom Cruise also, in that clip, you can hear that he is... He's trying not to get more angry, even though yeah. he's, he's angry and he's swearing. He, he, the point that he's making, perhaps not expressed in the best way, no. he's clearly at the end of his rope, but is, yeah, okay, it's a professional point, which is we need, we've got a lot of, you know, we're, we've got stuff to do here. And is, it is the thing, you know, there's He's a lot very much the boss of those films. He's producer. And but also, film. isn't that tying in with like the whole kind of, my perception, but I think a lot of people's perception of Tom Cruise, is actually, there's a lot of mystery around him, but no everyone always, also. everyone I've always known who has slightly encountered him or worked with him, um, because I have, you probably in the same way in life, you probably in our kind of fields of work, we've come across people who have worked in some way with him directly or indirectly. Sure. And they always say the same thing, which is 100% professional. He's yeah. just committed to think. That's, that's why he's still a movie star at like 60. Yeah. I, I, the, the overall thing I heard about Tom Cruise is that when he says something and he, when he speaks to you, he speaks directly to you. It's very thought out, direct, yeah. clear, and he doesn't. He doesn't mince words. No. It's like it's like he already knew every conversation that was going to happen mm. and how to have it. Do you know what I'm just thinking of when you say that is when he just goes, Kittredge, you've never seen me very upset. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's like, I imagine he's really intense sometimes. Yeah. Mission Impossible one. When yeah. he's not happy. Yeah. Oh, I reckon ooh. he's really like, no, no, listen to me. You know, he's yeah, old. Yeah. Uh, we have to get the shot. <laughs> no, 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 Peter, you, you, yeah. you cross the line. You, you cross the line. There, <laughs> Uh, if you ever really just by bored. the way Tom if you ever want to come on the show you love more to than have welcome you. Speak, uh, speak whatever up whatever you want to do we're here for it um, yeah there's some great back when you, you, you wouldn't get blacklisted for asking Tom Cruise about a Scientology question there are some wonderful interviews where he's doing press for War of the Worlds mm. um, and he, people ask him stuff and he just really does not take it well I think people have learned now is that if you ask Tom Cruise about Scientology you'll get a kind of probably a very bland polite answer and he'll never speak to you again yeah. that's why Graham like when he goes on Graham Milton you know you're know, never, never going to quiz him about that never. but also like I guess you're right. As a viewer, I don't want to watch a really stay. You know, this isn't this isn't an expose. It's Graham Norton. Like, uh, I'd love it if not Graham Norton, but a comedian on the sofa with Tom Cruise. Just be like, so what's Scientology uh, about? Like, yeah, yeah. What's that all about? Like, what? what, what <laughs> yeah. You have powers or something? And uh, they just left it in the cart, and I just want to see him react. Oh god. <laughs> you 
You know, someone asked me the other day what my opinion was of the MCU as a, as a whole. Not what individual shows are like, but like, what is my opinion of the whole entity, the beer moth, the whole the, cake. The, the 13, 14 years that it's been running. So, you know, obviously for ev- everyone, I'm sure, listening will about a couple this, of films here. But like there. Marvel Cinematic Universe. Your Iron Man. Yeah, so obviously this is, this is when Marvel Studios kicked off its own production of films. You know, this wasn't like Sony producing Spider-Man yeah. or Fox doing X-Men. You know, uh, Marvel started making their own films, started with Iron Man in 2008, and then it has led to where we are now. And it is obviously like, it's completely reshaped the industry, reshaped the way people think about uh, cinema for attendance. Or worse. For better or worse, it's had a huge influence. And so therefore, for better or worse, with this massive thing that's just changed our culture, what's your take on it? Yeah. No I mean, pressure. I mean, go, going from it as, as a whole, I definitely remember in the beginning when the, fir- the first film started to come out and there were hints that they were building to a larger... It wasn't really obvious from the get-go that these films were connected. No. Especially if you weren't really paying attention, you weren't super... In- so I remember watching The Hulk, which was this, the second or third it's film. Yeah, it's second. And at, they had an end credit scene where Tony Stark came in and yeah. was like, I wanna, I'm want i building together a team. And I remember seeing like, oh, that's cute, but they'll never do it. Ah, like really? they won't actually yeah. do, even though they obviously like had intention and then a few years later they would come out to release the Avengers. I still didn't think it was yeah. actually a thing that was possible. I mm. thought it was a fun little yeah. uh, Easter egg that all of these films were linked. And I, rem- I, don't know, I remember seeing the Avengers and being like, oh, this is just nuts. Yeah. But, but what's interesting as well is they didn't have their A-list characters. Iron Man, which now yeah. is like the biggest, the biggest comic yeah. book character ever, was serious, like B, C tier yeah. IP that Marvel had. Yeah. And then from that, it's just, it's just built. And, and for yeah. a very long time, there are so, there's so many different things to talk about within that. For a very long time, I was really like not anti the MCU. Because a lot of people were a bit mm. bored of seeing the films like three to two or three times a year yeah. come out. I was like, no, I think what they're doing is really special. And I was quite happy to defend it for a really long time. Yeah. And I was always leading up to the end game Infinity War saga. And I was like, yeah. this is special. And I'm, I'm glad I've paid attention. Some of the films are definitely better than others. Mm. But I'm so glad to have, been on the ride yeah. from my teen years into my young adult yeah. years, so I've always really enjoyed it. That's I, I think I think I'm on a similar point of view to you. I definitely there's definitely good and bad, and I and I always try to be very evenly balanced because people get people get people get crazy about these films. People like, have opinions like, on them. No, but like they either really hate them or they yeah. really love them, and I'm just like, well, it's easy to be evenly balanced. I actually think the whole of the first of Marvel Phase One is kind of like we talked about plane movies. Mm. They are they they are just like. Phase one. They're not. Yeah, phase one uh, is not doing anything different with um, superhero films other than linking them together. Like Iron Man one caught people's attention, which was nice because it wasn't anything we're familiar it was with. Sharp, witty, and the dialogue was really but, good. But two months later, they released Incredible Hulk, which was like your basic. It was such, such a basic cliché superhero film that we were audiences. I think were so tired of by mm. that point. Hulk's a hard one to get right. Because as soon as he turns green, the interest is over, which is yeah. what Ang Lee tried to fix when, it, when he did it with the Jacqueline Hyde kind the, of. The Hulk approach. movies remind me of what the Venom movies are doing right now. Right, you've seen them, but the it's, way that like the yeah. marketing for Venom Two is with two big monsters fighting each other is yeah. kind of similar. There's something really retrograde about the Venom and the Morbius, you know, films that came out from, from so- Sony. But that is also why I like the MCU because I feel like audiences were so bored of seeing. Um, startup franchises like pushed on them that were isolated and disposable films felt very disposable yeah everything was okay we're gonna begin this and maybe get you invested and we if we're lucky we get a sequel if not then it'll peter out and then we'll relaunch something over here and what marvel had done had said well why don't actually we reward your attention for viewing yeah these films won't feel disposable because it's actually part it's an episode in a much longer series and the more time goes on the more you'll be rewarded for sticking with it and the more you can get away with because you'll create an expanded world. And what's great is, as a format, comic books have done that for all the time. Yeah, exactly. Like they've always linked to each other and existed yeah. in the same universe and collaborated in each other's I, space. I always think Marvel reinvented the blockbuster. And what I yeah. really think is, like, by the mid-noughties, the blockbuster was kind of, like, washed and worn out. Look what happened to the Spider-Man films. It's like, they literally would, they would have kept making those films yeah. and, until they were rubbish. And do they remember, did. They do you remember some... how many times in the late noughties, how many people say, oh, cinema experience is dead. Uh, they're going to yeah. close down. There's no big screen yeah. event anymore. Exactly. And so then, since then, all the, the top 10 highest grossing films of all time have come out and have been Exactly. Huge. So, so um, 
so I, I, I like the fact that the MCU was almost like taking into account, we're not going to make these films disposable. We are going to actually engage and reward audiences in a different way. Yeah. So I really liked that. Also, I just thought it was, I'm inherently, and this is where maybe some people are different, I inherently find it quite thrilling when something from somebody else turns up as something else. Yeah. It's, like it's, when, when I was, I remember, I watched the It's the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood meme where Leonardo was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah. When I, when I, um, when I saw Incredible Hulk, um, uh, which was this is this is this is a blast in the past, right? I watched The Incredible Hulk a year after it came out on a laptop, sharing an earphone in a mock exam hall uh, oh in God. 2009, January 2009. Okay, so why were you not not doing okay, the exam? I, I was uh, well, uh, people had finished, and some people were doing the exam. Uh, the rest, everyone yeah. else was going to be studying, so we were quietly watching The Incredible. So I watched it with one earpiece. Such a thing, I, one earpiece. I know, share. and, and you know, again, cause the idea that like plane, the film would like come that. out a year ago, and only now people sort of watch, and it, and it was like pretty disposable rubbish yeah but then somebody then the guy i was watching it with was like oh yeah you know that's the thing from iron man and i was like oh <laughs> interesting you say? Bringing them cross-pollination <laughs> and so you start yeah. drawing uh, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, theories on the yeah, short wall. oh my goodness <laughs> uh and i thought i found that inherently thrilling i do think that the downsides with the mcu when it got into like the mid phase like in the mid mid of the last decade is that they were so invested in building towards something bigger mm. that actually films did start to feel really disposable again. And I, that was my big problem with Age of Ultron, which was like, they were like, oh my God, it's the it's Avengers again. And I was, and I was threat, like, though. yeah, I was like, I know this is going to be isolated to one film and I know you're bringing in Thanos later. It's not a fun one now to go back and watch because there's not very much that matters from it. Also, all those characters... Uh, always get rebooted after that film. Yeah. So like Thor, if you watch Age of Ultron, is so straight and boring. Yeah, and now he's, really he's so much more funny and easy. Oh. Um, chilled out. Also, I keep saying also, also, but um, I I think like a high point of respect for MCU is like Guardians of the Galaxy because that's a film that had no cultural attachment. Nothing. Audiences were not ready for that. The, it super, looked, the super nerds yeah. did, but even then yeah. it was... It looked ridiculous. You had a, you had a talking tree and a raccoon and... and it's very like space punk. Yeah. You, and you, and not, 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 that's not for everyone. Or, yeah, and space punk, space camp. And the, and the poster looked pretty, you know, average. Characters there but, shooting into but the But that, I think, I think that, that, that film is one of the most important films in that, the whole structure of the MCU because people loved it. I did. So I, re I really, yeah. I, you know, people really responded to it. And Marvel was like, we can, get, we, we can people, are gonna, people are following us now. People are willing to take the leap if we invest the time. And it felt really, it had such a different, unique tone and voice and like the way that it was directed and the yeah. music that was put into it. It had licensed music, which is outside of yeah. ACDC didn't really ha happen. Yeah. And look at the... Um, if you look at the poster design as an example of the MCU after uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, all those films are taking a much more cosmic, kind of like psychedelic direction. If like, yeah. you have the Thor Ragnarok poster where it's like the yeah. rings around and, you know, Doctor Strange, they go, like, oh, I'm going to go, you know, the, the kaleidoscopic visuals. Space punk rock and roll. Yeah, and like Ant-Man going down sub-quantum and yeah. they're really engaging with that. So my, that my, main, my main thing, like you talked about, um, you know, things being disposable and... Mm. and so maybe feeling a bit tired. I really think that they could learn from ta letting some of their films breathe, mm. and because they, they are, you know, they're a machine and they're yeah. making money. So they have every every indicator f from without a human looking at it says make more, make more, keep making, yeah. and people are hungry for it. But there were so many times I thought I don't want another film now after I've just seen that. Let yeah. this let this breathe, especially after Infinity War and Endgame, even in the gap. Um, I wish they hadn't done yeah. Spider-Man 2, the, Tom Holland Spider-Man yeah. 2 straight afterwards, because Endgame was such a full stop in a chapter that everything had built to, and I felt like mm. you were just constantly shoving it. It was like, I'm, I'm full. I'm so full. I, I thought it was I'm, brilliant, and yeah. I'm so full. Let me let me think on that for a year, mm. and then come come back with something yeah. really exciting. To also, yeah, to also defend Marvel as well on something. I, I, you know, there is... I think uh, people underestimate how hard it is once they'd started that train and all those different channels of films mm. to keep that in check. And um, one has to come before the next. Yeah. As they and when I watched Endgame, I rewatched it recently. 
I, I was like, actually, no, this film, this film actually does really work. If you're not invested in this world, then don't bother. But actually, that film, to, to successfully conclude a series of like 22 films... With that with, many characters? With that many characters, with a satisfying, you know, um, emotional beats to it. Arc. I mean, obviously, like, there's the whole nonsense, the fact that Tony, Tony Stark just invents time travel. Like, yeah. I get it. Overnight. It's, yeah, I know. It's ridiculous. And, and in a little bracelet as He's well. He's like, so, uh, I did it. Yeah, I figured it out. I figured it out. But um, he, like, he goes like this with some DNA, mm. like twists it the right way and goes, yeah. oh. But I, you know, that it, it, the, ultimately Endgame is really satisfying and it is so hard to achieve that. And that film also, I noticed with all Marvel, it's working really hard to give you a good time. Uh, some more than others. I mean, like we felt Black Widow really, like, really yeah. miss, a bit much of a miss. But, but like, Endgame, I think, is working really hard to it's deliver on it's the beat. Three hours as well. It doesn't waste your time in yeah, that at all. But, but I, I mentioned that because um, with like, uh, you know, like, when DC tried to catch up and they tried to build their own world and like mm. Batman versus Superman, when people like slag off um, the MCU and, 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 and stuff, I'm thinking, no, no, you don't know how, if look at the DC, DC, what DC tried to do. That's when you do it badly. That's when you yeah. do it sloppily. You can tell that was messy, didn't have a strong direction, didn't really know what it was doing, trying to play catch up, trying to imitate something else. And by comparison, you can see the strengths of Marvel, which is like, we have an idea, we have a plan, we know, where, we, ha we know where we're going. I agree that like, sometimes it's like, yeah, give me, I got, I got enough Marvel. No, and, I, and I was definitely on with the thought of like, okay, you've had your hits, your misses, at the end of Endgame, we're calling it quits, I'm gonna move on with my life. Yeah. And then I went. Well, then I watched all the Disney Plus shows, um, <laughs> yeah. except for Falcon. I have uh, CBA with that one. Oh yeah, it's a bit. It's a bit. I, I was really excited for that for some reason. Then it was very dry, and it wasn't interesting at all to me. Um, uh, my thing with Falcon and Winter Soldier is the reason I'm not going to watch it is uh, it's a superhero genre. I want to see people shooting laser beams out of their hands. Okay. Yeah. Just give me that. I want people to be, see people be superhuman. I don't need to watch the Born Identity done by Marvel. Is it interesting what you're saying about you know the Infinity War Endgame culmination, which represented like a, a, a full stop to so many stories? I remember thinking going into that, it, like, a excited for the movie and b curious of like can they do it? Mm. I was so I was really wondering yeah. like is it possible to yeah. to actually make this work and sure they had like two movies in five five and a half hours yeah. to get it done yeah that was like my main takeaway is that like, as you were saying yeah. laying the tracks and clearly having thought about what avengers three and four would look like yeah. and what are the 20 steps beforehand yeah. for us to get there and that can't yeah. cannot be taken away and there was a really cool moment where you, i think it was very exciting to be building up two or three films away from those mm -hmm. those last two avengers films and think look back at what they'd done and it essentially made the most expensive tv show yeah. ever yeah. over two decades or yeah. one and a half decades. And it was just quite fun yeah. to, to have done that, trying to think that everyone having theories. No, no, what's going to happen yeah. is, no, no, but the stone is yeah. over there and everyone having an idea of, yeah. and then time travel gets into it and you're like, well, this just changes yeah. everything. Well, we know from watching Game of Thrones that it's very easy to um, uh, put off your payoff for, for, for something in the future. Yeah. So Game of Thrones would always promise, put some, promise, never promise it for the final series. And then when the final series came, they obviously buckled and they couldn't do anything with it. Mm. What a shame if MCU hadn't had really like dropped the ball. At the... Yeah, but it, it probably would have been more likely for them to have done that. Yeah. I, I went into watching this film thinking this is going to be a mess. We were conditioned to expect it not to work. But, you know... Uh, people also underestimate how uh, pe people's like visceral response to, to the film. So Endgame, you know that that moment when they all come out of the rings, right? The toy box just yeah. gets tipped yeah. up on the bedroom floor. And that is, I know, most people I know who enjoyed those films and watched those films had like a visceral reaction. Like you and I saw it together and I was I like jumping up and down in my like seat. And I was like grabbing like... it. And I know, I know people who cried. I know people who shed tears. And, and when Cap grabs like the hammer crying. as well. And the Ugh. fact that that can have a visceral reaction on you shows its hold. It cares. And also you can't pull out that, you can't pull that off unless that, you've done it for 10 years. Films have tried. Yeah, but, Rise of Skywalker tried that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, they tried to draw on that, but that only works when Marvel have done what they've done, which is at that point had taken 11 years to get you invested. So when this literally five minutes, that's all it is, yeah. turns up, you it delivers. It's, all your it's the punchline of the joke that they've been setting up all this time. Rise of Skywalker did it twice. They did it, spoilers for Rise of Skywalker. They did it at the end when all the other ships that got the call turned up, yeah, and they did it nothing. again when all the Jedi were standing behind, behind Rey. <sighs> Yeah. Such a shame that film. Yeah, the Star Wars is. We could do another chat about yeah. the state of well, Star Wars another day. I never thought I'd, I, you know, I loved Star Wars when I was younger. And I never thought I'd get to the point where I was more interested in Marvel and what was happening with that yeah. than um, Star Wars. I'd say like George, George and I probably our early film bonding was over the hype cycle of the Force yeah. Awakens. It was yeah. that that film coming out. 
That seems like such an that, that ancient teaser time trailer. Ago. Oh god, that's, what, it was 2014, 2013? 2015, 2015, 2015 the film came out. You're, 2014. Either I'm really good at dates or you're no. really bad yes, at dates. I know I know the film came out in December 2015. <laughs> oh, but, but yes, remember yes, there yes. was a trailer the like 18 months December 2014. It was, it was, no, 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 that was so it. No, no, the teaser. Uh, it was like November 2014. I remember. Yeah. I remember it's I, it was, over yeah. a year out that, that, that's that hype cycle. that was dangerous levels of hype for the Force Awakens. Even though it's not a perfect film, I think that film Yeah, it still paid off though. But um just one thing on Marvel as well, like, so we've talked about its strengths. There are weaknesses. There are misses. You know, we, like I said, Black Widow. Yeah. Thor 2. Oh, Thor 2 is really ropey. Really ropey. Really Incredible bad. Hulk. Um, yeah. And some of them don't work as well. But then paying off what they've been building all this time, they can do things like Loki. Yeah. which is really interesting. And they can do things like WandaVision. Like them doing TV stuff makes so much sense. Yeah. Because they're not doing... In the same way it makes sense for Star Wars with the Mandalorian. I like it with like... Their t- yeah, and I like with their TV shows, they've not just taken the structure of a film and broken it up and made it slower. They are going, no, no, this is going to be yeah. paced differently. It's yeah. going to be... We're going to have as much spectacle on certain things. It's just going to yeah. be a different energy to it. And you go you turn yeah. up to the film for, for, for those experiences. And also, I inherently don't think that Marvel treats its audience like idiots. Yeah. Like it's ba- what Marvel is doing at the moment is basically saying, look, we're going to do the multiverse soon. And we know that means absolutely nothing to people. So we're going to break it down to you gently and get you established and familiar and open to the concept that there are multiple universities. Universities? <laughs> You're going to Oxford. You're going to Cambridge. Multiple universes. Uh, everyone's just always like, Bath Uni? <laughs> <laughs> well, I will take it. Yeah. Um, uh, but and and so you can't just dump that on an audience and say, oh, it's just set in like multiple different realms. You know, in the old days, in like two thousand and three, they would have just like had one film where they probably would have set up the multiverse in like twenty minutes, and then got off and done it. And they're like, yeah. no, you've got to put the time in, sow the seeds, let people grow into it. I think interesting looking back on it and what we were saying before about what it's what the impact it's had on the cinema, the blockbuster, yeah. everyone else's impression, like you know, seeing the, the react reactions from other studios to try and replicate what they've done. And interesting hearing from some of the directors who probably look over the garden fence and see what Marvel are doing and how much money they're yeah. making, how much love and attention they get. And and they're almost a bit like, yes, it is it is a bit of a you can look at a year of films and go, well, fifty percent of the biggest films that are coming out are people wearing capes and superheroes mm. but when they are working like they yeah. are I, I do have, i do have time for them yeah. and like you were saying about people's people's hot take being a, 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 just an impression of whatever the last one was yeah. so i feel like a lot of the time mcu is only as good as the last yeah. hit they've come out with yeah so it could either be a really high or you can come out with something really really bad it was like oh i, oh, I don't want yeah. all these marvel movies they're so bad now they're so bad mm. and the really good one comes out and they're like oh it's so yeah. good. i'm so happy for it so i've noticed people yo-yo a lot on it when it's, it's a marathon not a sprint I think that the way that people uh, assess the quality of those films as well is completely devoid of the context of those films. In the same way that you talked about Tom Cruise, um, you said, you know, Ricky Gervais defended him and said, no, it's, it's, he's making a $250, you know, million. And that's why I think these films should be recognized for. It's like, well, these are part of a massive process and they're doing things. So how does that film function within a series and how does it film deliver that thing for its audience? It's not about what does, you know, Thor 2 have to say about existence. People people are quite opinionated on them. They have a reaction because they're- Have have you been online? (laughs) Yeah. And yeah, like thinking about people's reaction to it, I remember some directors have come out and not been really happy with them. Like Martin Scorsese came out and made that comment about them uh, being junk food. Uh, no, 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 mis- no, 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 no. That is misquoting him. He okay. didn't say they were junk food. No, no, he said they were like. No, no, nah, nah, yeah, he said that. No, nah, sorry, people, people misremember that Scorsese, Scorsese quote. Defending. What he was saying was that mean the the way that those films are produced and that the type of films they remind him of theme park rides and roller coaster rides for what they're trying to ask of an audience and what they're trying to deliver. He wasn't saying that they were rubbish. He wasn't yeah. saying they were bad. What he was saying was that the film industry is unbalanced because most of the films that are being made are aiming to be theme park rides and stuff. And what there isn't any space for is the other stuff. The that, Irishman. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Think, you know, other types of films to get away from that. Well, he wasn't saying they were bad and and people were really quick to say, oh, Martin Scorsese hates Marvel and people were always asking him to qualify his comments, but that... I, he wasn't saying they were bad. Yeah, he was just saying that that it's it's un, unbalanced. Yeah, the the weighting's off. I, I think it probably is a shame that from a Scorsese or any other any director that's trying to do something that isn't that and wants to find a market for that. Mm. I reckon so many 
algorithms and stock flow charts yeah. of everyone in all the corporates is going, no, no, we just need to keep doing this to make money. Yeah. And I don't want everything else that's good in the cinema to become shoved into this very small yeah. corner where yeah. people don't think that there's a market to go see it. Because all we said before is that the the cinema was was had the bells of death ringing for it in, mm. in the noughties. And then that was just absolutely not true because everyone thought, well, with Netflix mm. and online, why would you go to the cinema yeah. when actually the market just responded by making films that you want to see in yeah. the cinema? But that's Scorsese's point is that Sure. Okay, cinema didn't die, but the, the, the space that the, yeah the space that the cinema catered for before has become much more specific to those yeah. bigger films. He made a really good point. I don't I don't want everything to consolidate into into everything feeling the yeah, same. Uh, yeah, hom- homogenized. Yeah. Do, do feel the same, and you don't you don't want that. You no, want absolutely. Be, I want I want to go and see loads of different experiences. Scorsese made a really good point earlier this year in a piece of the New Yorker, I believe, like like a leading uh, like guest ed piece. I think I, I think I remember. And this, it was yeah. and it was really powerful because what he was saying was this wasn't about. My this was actually about streaming services as much about about the space the lack of uh spaces where you can go and appreciate films and it's obviously like the fact that cinemas are dying and the only places you can go see to the cinema are the bigger ones and he was to paraphrase him what he's basically saying is if you have a carousel the way that the carousel operates on netflix and all the streaming services there's no way you've got you know you could have uh, an ingmar bergman film right next to the seven seasons of The Sopranos. Yeah. And there is no way of appreciating the differences and nuances of those two works of art together because they're just a catalog of content. Yeah. And I think what he was trying to say is like, it's the difference between a warehouse and an art gallery. Yeah. So, so you go to a warehouse and it's like, here's all the content you ever want. Pick out what you need. Go ahead. And that's what we've been given with streaming services, so right? But what he was saying is, no, you need to have an art gallery where the works of art are given the space that they require for you to appreciate them properly. The lighting, the, the Yeah, the so you go to an art gallery, it's like, this is an exhibition on this <clears throat> type of film. You, so you're not going to put a, a Picasso up next to a Van, uh, you know, next to a Van Gogh, next to a, just, just because it's there. You're going to make sure that when people come to see that film, they can appreciate it within the context properly. And that's what cinema used to be doing. You'd go to a, you know, a picture house to go and see... Uh, you know, something respected in its own way. Isn't it, isn't it mental how many times you hear, considering we have access to all the content that's ever been made yeah. pretty much, and you can watch it at any time you like, how much you don't have anything to watch. Yeah. But when that, that factor of when something was just on TV, you would watch yeah. it anyway. Yeah. I feel like it's it's kind of similar to that. Totally. Like there is a factor of, oh, that's on. I would never have thought yeah. to put that on or watch it. But yeah. here I am watching this movie. Yeah. I do that kind of at Christmas now because Christmas yeah. I tend to what, turn on like the original like mm. traditional TV and have a flick through because there's good Christmas content. But that, that exact factor is the same. If something is on in cinemas, you go, oh, it's being presented to me. Mm. I'll watch it, but I have no interest in just coming up with an idea of what to watch myself. And again, the carousel of content is so easy to just flick through and, and mind-numbingly just have it yeah. pass you by. Like, it's, it's very good very good comparison, the yeah. warehouse gallery. Uh, that was, a, you know what, that was actually just, me. Yeah, yeah, that was you. I, I, that wasn't Scorsese, but I was, in, I was, I was yeah. in theorizing, just, you know, to give myself a little bit of kudos yeah. there. But- um, Well done for citing him. What it is, what it comes down to is a lack of curation, a lack of like personal t- mm. taste. How often I have this, where something is sat on your watch list that you've been wanting to watch for, for ages, and you do sincerely would like to watch that film, yeah. but it's just stuck on your watch list and it just takes one person you know to say oh yeah we watched that that was quite good or you, or you hear someone reference it on, on on a show yeah a character will say it's like they've been in that film and you'll go oh I better watch that now and yeah. then it's suddenly broken out of this cocoon and you get to watch it and it's a i've experienced so many great films that way that have just been stuck in amber on my watch list yeah. and some small small nudge it'll finally get released like i had that okay really bad example because it wasn't an amazing film but like the king of staten island yeah a bit on my like watch list for about a year and it was just there and i knew i could watch it whenever i wanted but mm. and then it, all it took was me listening to mark maron podcast and he was talking to steve buscemi and he just referenced it in like 10 seconds yeah. and I went oh yeah oh yeah I'd love to see that and it's just that personal touch that personal curation yeah you know when I really get through films is so I can go sometimes I can have a really busy month and I just haven't really watched any films or nothing was out in the cinema but if I know I have to get on a plane or I know I'm going on a holiday mm. and I go ooh time off yeah. what, what films do I want to watch and I load a load of them up on my yeah. iPad and then boom I'm just like in a week I'll watch four or five and that's really great yeah. because I thought what do I want to watch what do they miss yeah. I, I create myself a little channel Do you know what I've just realized is what I've had a really interesting thing with film this year where I am struggling. I've struggled to watch films in the same way that I used to because 
Uh, I've, I've had more time at home, much more time in the evenings to watch films. And at the beginning of the year, I was just like getting through so the, like oh, lockdown. Yeah, yeah, films. but but like you know, trying to push the like trying to watch you know different films, uh, really yeah, saying, esoteric yeah. films. But I've realized now that what that was doing is you can't just mainline films like their content. These films have to be respected in their own way. Can't so binge them, you imagine, want to sit on them. Yeah, it's like imagine trying to raid the 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 the, the kitchen cupboards at Nomu. You know, right? the, you know. You, well, you, it's like if I just showed you a slideshow of the hundred best paintings of all time. Yeah, but didn't yeah. really give you time to go. Well, here's where it's come yeah. from. Here's the artist. And not that you wouldn't look into it. But, but the difference like, is, like, oh, you've seen it. You've, you've seen, seen the it. painting. Yeah, you've seen it. Yeah, yeah. I've showed you the art. You've you have experienced, experienced the it. art. Yeah. If I sh- if I mention the painting, yeah, I've seen that painting. But yeah. It's about t- smelling the roses. Uh, yeah, totally. We were loving our warehouse carousel museum uh, analogy today. Thank you very yeah. much. That's a, it's all it's it all it's all in the tea. It's definitely for the the not not that they have any moral obligation, but I think it's an interesting one for anyone running a streaming service to try and figure out. Well, that's what Mubi tries to do differently. So Mubi has seasons, you know, like in, in the same way that a, that a, that, a, that a cinema would, you know, an old oh, an old school right. picture house. So in the same way that the BFI will run a season about, I don't know, yeah, Ingmar Bergman. Mubi will do a season about, oh, we're going to do it about Femme Fatales. Are we going to do this? And so, because Mubi has a lot more films than it used to be because it's had to buck yeah. to the demand, but it used to be the case that like they'd only have a set number of films on their channel and it would be like, well, if you catch it this month, it's about Femme Fatales, but next month we've got right. these whole other new films that come on. It's, it's like a seasonal them. menu. Exactly. So what do you got for me? So usually we play a game at the end of our episodes. Correct. And while this is not so much a game, more of a thought exercise. I told you. <laughs> okay. I told you. Careers counselor. I told you. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you see yourself in 5, 10, and 15 years? <laughs> what are your strengths? You're waiting for a train. Yeah. A oh train that'll take you very far. <laughs> James and Philippa are waiting. Inception Horrible, 2010, yeah. Christopher Nolan. Um, I was thinking, I, I told you a few days ago, I was like, I want you to think about movie cameos mm. the good ones the bad ones sure. i didn't say anything specific i wanted you to just have some of them yeah. bubbling up into your frontal lobes okay and i i you know i was thinking a lot about films and ways which you can talk about them and the film cameo film cameos are everywhere mm-hmm. and some of them are great and some of them are bad right. and i wanted to hopefully by the end of today go through some of the all-time famous yeah. i've obviously got them all because in the interest of time but some of the famous film cameos yeah especially in some of the films we, we think about some of the actors that have turned up in them and i want us to say whether or not they worked yeah why they didn't and i hope by the end of this we can go what is a good way to use a film cameo yeah and what great. is just a horrible distracting yeah. flash in a film that just takes you out of the experience, yeah. right? So I'm going to start listing off some films. Sure. I'm, I'm sure you've probably seen them or aware of them, or maybe I'll surprise you with, with some of them. <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're going to start with, at least for in recent film history, the king of the, the movie Cameo, know, which is, said. of course, Matt Damon. Matt Damon. I've got three films on here. Yeah. I know he's done more. But the three films I put on for his Cameo was Interstellar, which yeah. I know isn't a cameo. It's almost it, extended I cameo, it's an extended but yeah. cameo. Thor Ragnarok. Yeah. yeah. Which I thought was a good one. Yeah. And do you remember the film Unsane yes, with yes, Claire Foy? Yes. So uh, I'm going to start with Unsane. Right. Unsane is a film um, starring Steve, Claire Foy. Yeah. Who was it again? It was Steven Soderbergh's Steven film. Soderbergh. He shot it all on an iPhone. Shot it all on an iPhone. And it's, you know, set in a... It's like a it, psychological thriller. Yeah, yeah. She, she gets admitted in... She has a stalker. She gets admitted into a mental asylum and her stalker is running the asylum or something. Like, yeah. Really Very kind of like gothic overtones. Yeah. All shot on like fairly wide angles, fairly CCTV like, but quite ridiculous. Film, Matt actually. Damon makes the most distracting oh, cameo God, about yeah. two thirds of the way through. And yeah. me and George went, actually went to a press screening of that, and it, we I remember laughing yeah. out loud because I could not a believe before, yeah, because the, the, like, the, there are moments. Matt Damon is a, a top, 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 yeah, yeah absolutely. And if he's in your movie, if, if it's a Jason Bourne film, you go, that's fine, it's not Matt Damon, it's yeah. Jason Bourne. I'm in to see Jason Bourne, yeah. but when he turns up sometimes, yeah. like in the first five minutes, he's an interested, I'm like, Matt Damon's in this movie, yeah, that's Matt Damon, yeah, uh, so, and eventually we, we yeah. get warmed up into it. But talk, talk about some well, of those, well, okay? Well, so ones. first of all, I'm saying it doesn't work because basically it's a flashback to uh, Claire Foy's character going through the safety procedures to protect her from the stalker and you have this like voice um, describing all the measures she has to take mm. which is very serious and it's the voice of a policeman and, and, and then it suddenly cuts and you're looking at this policeman and it's Matt Bloody Damon <laughs> and it's so distracted because you're like I'm That's meant to be Matt focusing Damon. on this horrible experience this character is having it, have, having 
and and he's meant to be just playing a nondescript policeman, and it's like Matt Damon, Matt Damon, Matt Damon, Matt Damon, and then he's off screen, and your and your brain is is distracted. For Interstellar, I think it just about works because not only is it longer than a cameo, it's a slightly extended cameo, but they build up to the fact of his character. They say, oh, Dr. Man was the one of the best of us. One of the so there is this kind of like celebrity aura around him. So when it is someone like Matt Damon, you're like, okay, I, I, can, I can get with it that. It still hits you though when you see yeah. it. You're like, oh. But, and Thor Ragnarok probably works the best because he, it's like, the, that is the joke. It's like, oh, the, the, this actor, he's playing, he's playing one, a, a, the, a theater actor in Asgard. And that film is so much more fun and yeah. quirky and skittish than all the other ones. Yeah, are. it's like, you think you know what's happening? Well, guess what? That's Matt, that's Matt Damon, Sam Neill, and, uh, it, yeah, and one it, of the Hemsworths it, it, In Thor Ragnarok, there. there's a scene when uh, Thor returns to Asgard yeah. after Loki's taken control of it, and he's doing like a sort of old folk play version yeah. of the events of the previous films. Yeah. And playing uh, Odin is Matt Damon. No, Loki is Matt Damon yeah. playing. Uh, and it's Sam, Sam Neill is, is Odin. Yeah, yeah. it's very uh, You know he's in the next really well. as well. Oh, I'm and sure, yeah. But anyway, I thought Matt, da Matt, the Matt Damon well, 3. Those so Oh, two sorry. things on that. You've missed out one very famous. I'm not yeah, David, it's, Gary. It's Did you remember loads. Euro Trip? Yes. There's, Scotty there's doesn't know. There. Yeah. And that was that was good because that's like peak Matt Damon. He was still really hot and fresh. And Euro Trip is, is quite a small, trashy film. Yeah. Has some laughs in it. I'll, I won't deny yeah. it. But, um, and then he, he turns up for just as a punk skinhead yes. and does this, this, this breakup song. Um, but he was on Mark Maron recently talking about... Uh, how he turns sure. up and everything. Oh, right, uh, yeah, yeah. And he just said, it's because I love to act. It's like, if it, it's the thing I want to be doing in my spare time. I love it so much. I'm happy just to turn up for five minutes and That's do it. So and I thought, good on you, Matt. Yeah, I started with those three because I thought yeah. good use, yeah. very bad use, and kind of an in-between where yeah. there's some, there's a bit of a shock factor. It's a distract in the beginning, but it eventually works. And yeah. I think Matt Damon was really good in Interstellar. I thought, I thought yeah, it really worked. Yeah, yeah, it worked. Um, there's two others I wanted to put to you. Yeah. These are directors turning up in their movies. Okay. Obviously, this happens a lot of, of the course, time. But two I wanted to bring up is Quentin Tarantino at the end of Django Unchained and then M. Night Shyamalan at the end of The Village. Okay, well, I, okay, okay. All right, well, just let me just stop on The Village because I have seen The Village, mm. but only once a long time ago. And from what I've heard recently, if you go back and rewatch that, it holds up really, it really does. well. The Village does hold up. And I it would, was a meme for a so, long time. So actually, I would like to go back and rewatch that. So let's not talk about that. But, but yeah. M. Night Shyamalan does turn up in Unbreakable and he also turns up in Glass, like, which was so- I think, all, I think in all of his films. Okay, he's well, in Lady in the Water But he, well. he can't act and he's, no, and he's not very good. And, and he's just so distracting and the camera really lingers on him anyway. <laughs> For, for, for as good as he can act, he gets far too much time oh, on, on the... God, yeah. You can tell in the editing room, he's like, no, 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 hold yeah. that shot a bit longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, me. it's me. Quentin Tarantino and Django Unchained. Mm. Uh, I mean, I think I've seen that also, from Also, Quentin Tarantino turns up in his movies. Okay, so him. when he's in Reservoir Dogs, that's yeah. fine. I think that character was... Min Min Mr. Brown, who he plays, was originally meant to be Mr. Um, uh, Steve Buscemi, and they yeah. switched, switched it around. So he, he kind of works in that, in that film because he's barely in it. I don't mind him in Pulp Fiction where he plays the, you know, the guy with the coffee. It ain't the coffee yeah. in my cup, okay? Yeah. Um, and he always does the same kind of guy. Yeah, really. well, he can't really act. No. He's just, he's just, he's just, he just, he is just a character in real life. You know what he can so, do? He can be enthusiastic on camera. Yeah, that's what he can do. It's not bad. No, he can, he can deliver a line really intently. Yeah, and, so and go, that's for, why I like it. For the specific character, it's fine. But then when he turns up playing an Australian <laughs> at the end of Django Unchained, it's so distracting. So, oh. And that's a, that's a long film. Oh, and I think, I yeah, think it was tedious. I, I think it's that brilliant bit. Yeah. that the last act I think oh, yeah. doesn't end when you think it does, and it keeps yeah. going. And then to have Tarantino yeah. coming at the end. You're like, is it we starting fuck? a new Yeah, what's going on? Film? Yeah. 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 Just to get the Tarantino in it. So so that doesn't work. And I'm glad he wasn't in uh Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um the other th well, you mentioned a director going into a film. Mm. Have you seen Manchester by the Sea? Yeah. Right. There's a scene in that where um have I seen Manchester by the Sea? <laughs> okay, there's a scene that where Kenneth Lonergan, who's the director, yeah. turns up because Casey Affleck and Lucas Hedges are walking towards the car, and Casey Affleck like tell something like hurry the fuck up or something like that yeah. and Kenneth Lonergan walks past and says a oh, nice language and um, they get into this altercation this fight and then it's just this argument and then Kenneth Lonergan walks away so it's meant to be just like a random fight with a stranger it's quite amusing but Kenneth Lonergan walks away and then the camera like breaks away and just follows Kenneth, Kenneth Lonergan for about five seconds on his own like, like he's in his own little just film to really give it time and then it cuts back to Casey Affleck and I was just like I, the fact that you lingered on yourself makes me know that you're the director yeah. I just I just yeah I think P Peter Jackson in the Lord of the Rings films does the brief cameo that works. He's only ever on it for a, a second. Right. But he'll oh, be a yeah, he'll be the carrot man. Right. Yeah. yeah. He, he do, he's done a lot of them, but he doesn't. He doesn't waste time with it. Actually, a bit, more, a bit of an extended cameo, but in Manchester by the Sea, when Matthew Broderick turns up, 
Do you remember oh, that Matthew yeah. Broderick? And he because he and Kenneth Lonergan are good friends, and he's in love. He plays uh, Lucas Hedges's mum's step boyfriend, bo- boyfriend, husband, boyfriend, yeah, partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I completely forgot about that. And it's just like I mean, he's flagged at the credits at the beginning. He's like and Matthew Broderick, but he turns to me like, oh, yeah, Ferris, Ferris, Ferris Bueller. You know, and I like Matthew Broderick. I always enjoy his presence. example of a distracting cameo. Yeah, but perfect. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Because like, oh, okay, okay. I'm just saying, and I'm like, are you going to be in? Are you going to be in the? Pl- are you going to be in this more? Yeah. Uh, moving into some weird and wonderful ones. I love this. Right, bring it. Um, Die Another Day. I know we were talking about James Bond uh, a couple of weeks ago. Madonna in Die Another Day. Yeah. Obviously, explain explain what was she is she a fencer in it? She yeah, there's this whole um fencing sequence in the movie where they where him and Gustav Graves Bond and Gustav Graves, the enemy, start fencing and then it's like, How about we up the sticks, shall we? Let's do it like the old ways. First blood drawn from the torso and he like whips off some swords from the from the wall at the night the night realm and they start having the most insane fight around like what looks like a very posh fencing club and madonna for some reason yeah. is like running this little fencing club which, and she's in it yeah. and obviously she does the, the song yeah. for die another day which is how, how she got the in but again distracting like, it is distracting because madonna, madonna is like super famous and like you know and she has all these knowing looks with bond like there's a backstory but she doesn't come back again or it, n- none of yeah. the lingering knowing looks it's become literally relevant. i've done the theme tune i want to be in the movie it's just, or just you've done the theme tune you need to be in the movie yeah yeah but like you know adele wasn't in skyfall <laughs> What? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Billy Eilish wasn't in no time. Yeah, to that's a very good point. Very good point. Um, right, this is a good one. All right. Donald Trump in Home Alone 2. Yeah. So yeah. even though, try to forget the Donald Trump we know today, right? Just yeah. try, really try mm-hmm. and erase that. Mm-hmm. Forget what we think about Donald Trump. Yeah. I think an effective cameo because <laughs> it doesn't waste your time. <laughs> okay. And it makes sense for the film. And you're like, Donald Trump. Okay, in the context of seeing that in like 1992, yeah. I believe, um, as an audience member, the idea that he's asking for directions because he's lost in New York and he asks this person who he thinks is a stranger, but actually turns out to be a very famous New Yorker. Yes. You know what? In I, that time. In that time, in that context. Also, he's a New York businessman in that kind of hotel. It establishes the kind of hotel it is. It, you're right, as a functioning a cameo. Effective. You know what? That is a very effective cameo. Now, given the last oh, few years, whoa. incredibly distracting, yeah. unavoidable. You yeah. cannot not comment on, that's Donald Trump, <laughs> yeah. that man. You can't not comment on it. But at the time, yeah. perfect. Yeah. Exactly yeah. what you want Donald yeah. Trump to do in yeah. this life. <laughs> And I just saw that on a. This was like, yeah, that's a really that's weird a really one good that's point. Discussing, um, Mike Myers in Inglorious Bastards. Right, yeah, I love, I love that because that was also at the time when Mike Myers' his career had basically gone gone to shit. He made the Love Guru, which is an appalling, oh, I've not seen appalling it. film. Yeah, really, really, and like he was basically put in movie jail, which is understandable. I think he's out now. He's out of movie, Jeff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, you turned up a Bohemian Rhapsody. It's Bohemian Rhapsody, yeah. yeah, that was on my list as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. well, Mike Myers. And the, see, the Bohemian Rhapsody one makes sense because it's the comment of the way he was a larger than life character that as well. That is the biggest is amount good. of nuance there is in that film. Yeah. Um, but in, uh, in, in Glorious Bastards, I also think it works because he's, he's famous for playing a uh, horrible caricatured stereotype of a Brit with Austin Powers, right? Yeah. And here he is again playing what could be like Austin Powers' father yeah. in, in, in the wartime. And. Uh, and it kind of works. You've got Churchill sitting in the corner of the room. And yeah. I, I think it works. Effective. I think it's very effective. This is a weird one. Because you, you, we've got a mixture here. There's actors cameoing as characters. Yes. And there's people cameoing as themselves. Oh, yes. I've got one for you as well. Yeah, go on. Well, this is, this is, this is really the, the fuck, uh, head fuck of a one. Yeah. Pardon my language. But it's in Ocean's 12 when Julia Roberts, as Tess, the character, has to pretend to be Julia Roberts. Oh God, I don't yeah. remember that. That film is not a good film, and they run out yeah. of ideas. And they're like, "Oh, let's let's have this scene where um, Matt Damon is literally like, I think she, you know, don't you think she looks like Julia Roberts?" And then she has to, and and and, and, as, and as an audience member, you're like, uh, "Your brain's doing the homework." So hang on, so she's Julia Roberts, but she's not Julia Roberts, but she's played by Julia Roberts anyway. It's like in uh, Avengers when uh, Robert Downey makes a reference to Jeff Bridges yeah. when Jeff Bridges plays yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Obadiah State yeah, in the first yeah. one. You're like, "Ah, oh, this doesn't make sense," but <laughs> yeah, you got yeah. it anyway. Uh, speaking of Avengers, Joe Russo in the beginning of Avengers Endgame in the in the yeah there was the grief the, circle the, the grief circle run by Captain America uh, wasn't distracting because um, I don't know I, I don't know what any, didn't know what either of the Russos looked like right. and he was effective enough he was you know I would believe that was it was, it was a strangely um, sort of emotional cameo yeah like it, it, I'd love to hear like the reasoning behind it I've not really looked into it but it's one of those he has this really yeah. uh, heart wrenching line about losing his loved one you're yeah. like. There you go, Joe Russo. Get in your movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why not? Maybe, maybe somebody fell out that day, or maybe um, he just thought I wrote this really emotional beat. I'd like to deliver it. Yeah. 
Well, this well next one is a great, weird, and wonderful Go one. On. The Prestige. Oh, yeah, I love this one. Oh, I love it. I love it's, it. It's so oh, no, okay, 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 I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay, okay. I love The Prestige. Uh, one of my, love uh, the one prestige. of my favorite films, and I've seen it so many times. And you're watching this film, and you will be having a good time because it is a great time. Fantastic you're halfway film. through. You got human ja Hugh Jack human Jackman. Human Jack <laughs> you got Hugh Jackman doing his thing. You got Christian Bale doing his thing. And just when you think this film can't get any weirder, stranger, better, David Bowie walks in <laughs> as Nikola Tesla. As Nikola Tesla and gives a brilliant performance. Brilliant performance, slightly dodgy accent, but yeah. but also, have you heard Christopher Nolan's reasoning for that? No, go on. he was like Nikola Tesla was such a pioneer and avant-garde figure in his day and age yeah. with you know so ahead of his time he needed someone or wanted someone who captured that kind of vision and he was like david bowie is is like the nikola tesla of our age yeah. we, we need that kind of cultural figure to come in and play him and david bowie was like yeah sure he had that like half mid-stair visionary look to him where he, he could understand things that we couldn't even under like think of understanding yet yes mr angia have you considered the cost? Uh, price is not an object. No, but have you considered the cost? <laughs> <laughs> and Andy Serkis, like his little... Yeah, eagle. as Eli. Yeah. The guy. yeah, also, I mean, Andy, Andy Serkis, that, just referencing what we talked about last week, mm. guy's good in everything. Oh, Andy's fantastic. He turns up, he delivers. He fantastic. commits. Um, yeah, I love that about uh, Bowie being in that. Yeah. Okay. This is a very different one. Daniel Craig in The Force Awakens. Yeah, plays a stormtrooper. Plays right? a stormtrooper there. Yeah, um, he has a couple of lines. You know what? I'm fine with that because that was one of those things that uh, you're not aware. It doesn't distract you when you watch it first time. When you're aware of it the second time, it's like a neat little thing. And you read the story behind it. He was shooting Bond over this, uh, yeah, on the opposite soundstage and they walked in. And he, uh, Apparently he asked to be like in it barely. Yeah, he literally yeah. asked, I just want to do anything. And yeah. he said, and then JJ Abrams gave him a whole scene. Yeah, I know, <laughs> but, it's, but it's great. And when you, when you listen back, you're, oh, that is Daniel Craig yeah. in there. Um, yeah, that works. That's a good he one. He's always like, I never got paid. <laughs> <laughs> Probably made about 80 million yeah, per yeah. one film. Uh, I'm going to do, I think, we've got, we've got plenty, but I don't want it to go okay. on for too long. Last, last one, Johnny Depp in 21 Jump Street. Yes, which is a weird one. Like, yes. But I thought, really good. Right. 21 Jump Street used to be a TV series and they rebooted it, made it into films with Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum. Yeah. In this film with Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum, there is an, uh, a biker gang and one of the biker gangs strips his makeup off and it turns out to be Johnny Depp and one of the other actors who used to be in the TV series. Johnny Depp used to be in 21 Jump Street, the TV series. Yeah. So he turns up in character as his old character from Jump Street with this other guy who also used to be in Jump Street and then they get shot. And it's like a real huge guns pointing at people, yeah. action sequence, very intense dialogue. Yeah. And it's all just there. It's Johnny Depp. And you're like, wow, yeah, that's yeah. full on. Yeah, and he get, he's in prosthetics, then he takes the prosthetics off. There's definitely a difference between, just to wrap this up, between an actor coming in to play a part, sort of yeah. leaning more towards Interstellar, and like an extended cameo piece, like yeah. the Johnny Depp yeah. and uh, the, what was the other one? Tom Cruise in Tropic Thunder. Yeah, where it's like, you know the audience is going to react to this, but not because it's who the character is, but because it is this famous face. It yes. is this famous person, yeah. So, so what, what would you say, look, George, you, you get to decide all films going forward. It's a, a, anytime someone's going to have a cameo, they go, yeah. well, we have to give George a call and, and okay. he needs to give the approval right. of yes or no. Sure. What are the rules, the guidelines, the parameters for effective cameo use? I'd say short, sweet, and discreet. Mm. I'd say you keep it tight and it's, and it's a nice, rewarding... Um, wink to the audience and any and then if any audience member doesn't get it then they won't feel excluded if any audience member doesn't enjoy it then it's over quickly you can move on with the film and it doesn't disrupt the verisimilitude of the film okay Lovely word and i hope you have like a whole pamphlet on just how to use matt damon yeah <laughs> yeah one. matt you have different rules okay <laughs> matt's long he's like can i can i can i be in it i, I think also the tone of the film is is, is vital oh, like i said like it like with unseen he completely derails it you so need I'd to be screening the film entirely. short sweet and discreet baby there you go do, do you remember michael jackson in men in black 2 i want to be agent m i can be m yeah yeah <laughs>